Hi, welcome everyone. Um, I, my name is Courtney Brown. Um, I am a graduate student and poet here in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I am a student at Vanderbilt and I am so thrilled to be a part of this panel um, today with Jeff Vandermeer. Um, so I just wanna take a minute um, to welcome everyone on behalf of Humanities Tennessee, um, and to thank a couple of our sponsors, um, Metro Nashville Arts Commission, the Ingram Content Group, the Tennessee Arts Commission, um, as well as Vanderbilt University and Parnassus Books, um, who uh, are providing, selling lots of books um, for the festival, for these events. Um, if you are watching on Facebook Live or on YouTube, um, feel free to put any questions that you might have during the session in the chat. Um, we will try to get to as many as possible. Um, I'd also like to let you know that if you do make any purchases through uh, Parnassus Book, um, that is what helps keep this festival free and helps keeps us running. Um, and if you enjoy this event and want to support the festival or um, to check out the schedule for the rest of the Southern Festival of Books, um, please check out the website at humtn.org. Um, or otherwise, you could Google Southern Festival of Books 2001, it should come up. And now to introduce our speaker. Um, so Jeff Vandermeer is a New York Times bestselling author. Um, you may know him in particular from his Southern Reach trilogy, um, which has been translated into over 35 languages. Um, and the first novel of which, Annihilation, won the Nebula Award and Shirley Jackson Award and was made into a film by Paramount in 2018. Um, some other recent works include Dead Astronauts, Born, um, as well as The Strange Bird. And these novels set in the Born universe are also being developed for TV um, by AMC and continue to explore themes as with this latest novel, um, explore themes related to environment, animals, future, etc. What we'll be discussing today primarily is Vandermeer's latest work, um, Hummingbird Salamander, which um, is a slight deviation, but not so much um, from the weirder, more fantastical near future texts that um, he might be most known for into a little bit more of a mystery noir um, thriller at times. But we still have those emergent themes, um, very, very present, if not more so um, than ever, of environment, catastrophe, the sort of human impact on the landscape, on Earth. Um, and how do we recover from that? How do we sort of recognize and then treat the sickness that we have imposed on the land? Um, I just wanted to take a personal note and, and talk a little bit about my experience with Vandermeer's work. Um, the first story of his that I read was called This World is Full of Monsters. Um, and it made me think too about the way that Vandermeer's work complicates, stretches, pushes on, pierces the boundaries of genre in literature as well. Um, this World is Full of Monsters in particular, um, investigates, um, presents a, a world of stories, um, are physical beings um, that perhaps accost, encounter the writer, the artist um, in a way that might feel almost violent, but also in a way that feels as if the story has become part of the, the artist. And that was something that resonated um, with me. There's also a kind of urgency um, that this work uh, indicates at, as the protagonist of this, of this piece, the speaker um, runs into the street screaming, you know, do not stop me, story made me this way. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll get to touch on some of these themes a little bit more um, later in the talk. Um, but finally, before we get into a little bit of a reading, um, I just wanted to say that Vandermeer's work is 
disorienting, disarming, demanding, expectant, and enrapturing. But though these pieces may feel like at times they enact a kind of wounding, they also journey toward healing, um, a healing of the body, a healing of the landscape. Um, and that's something that I think is particularly evident in Hummingbird Salamander. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to introduce um, Jeff Vandermeer. Um, we'll do a little bit of a, a reading, about five minutes of a reading and take questions from there. Thank you so much, Courtney. Thank you for that, that wonderful introduction and uh, for that close reading of um, my own favorite story of mine. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, uh, thanks also to the Southern Festival of Books. Uh, Hummingbird Salamander uh, is is a noir mystery, is also uh, semi-speculative, uh, and it, it deals with the environment in a very personal way through basically the hummingbird and the salamander mm -hmm. of the title. So I thought what I would do is read a section that's very specific to the the hummingbird. And basically what happens is the main character who calls herself Jane, although she never gives her real name, uh, is a security analyst who's gifted with this piece of taxidermy of this hummingbird by a dead eco activist named Sylvina. And she gets caught up in the mystery of why would she give her this piece of taxidermy? What, what meaning does it have? What meaning does Sylvina have? Or, or could have in her life. And so she begins to investigate the hummingbird and that's the part I'm going to, to read right now. Information isn't story, Sylvina wrote. No animal should be condensed to a summary in encyclopedia. But all I had was information at first and a dead bird's body because that's all she'd given me. The naiad hummingbird she had written is of moderate size with an especially long migration that delights the most diligent of birders across its range. Although difficult to find and observe by humans, the brilliant colors and patterns of the males are adaptations to catch the eyes of their mates. I had a large female specimen then, pitch black, no nonsense. They are fine athletes, I read, whose stunt repertoire includes backward flight, treading air and maneuvering precisely in gusty wind and whose migration between the Pacific Northwest and Argentina equates to several back-to-back -back ultra marathons. I tried to imagine traveling that far as an adaptation through so many different kinds of terrain. This was an epic journey and one only allowed due to incredible specializations. The changes a human being would have to undergo to inhabit such places without equipment. Wouldn't they change your point of view too? Wouldn't you become someone else? And then there it was as well, status unknown. Not just rare then, but presumed extinct, last seen in 2007. I felt a pang of emotion as if this was a twist, but a twist that you could have seen coming. And after the pang, it took no time at all. That emotion began to recede to me, from me. That month, the southern white rhino and a species of pangolin had gone extinct. Wildfires in five countries meant that animals were crawling to the side of roads to beg people and speeding by in cars for water. People were poisoning vultures and shooting bats out of the sky, scared of pandemics. To care more meant putting a bullet in your brain. So like many, I had learned to care less. Sylvina called it the fatal adaptation. So I focused on the why. Why would a person named Sylvina leave, leave me this particular taxidermied animal? I saw the route the hummingbird took as evidence. Northwest, near me, local during part of the year. They might even have flown right through our neighborhood. In the middle of the night, headed somewhere that cared enough to put out sugar water or plant wildflowers. What sort of person would send me this kind of message? Sometimes a founder's psyche became reflected in their company and thus in how they handled security. But this wasn't about what happened subconsciously. This was a person who couldn't afford to be direct or who didn't trust me, but for some reason had to tell me something. Usually on some level, a message so dramatic called out for action. But Sylvina hadn't asked for anything except, I thought, to follow the clues. There in the parking lot, I loved that hummingbird with a fierce and protective love. 
but resentment flared up too. I could neither get rid of nor keep the hummingbird. Sylvina had made some essential decision for me, and it came with baggage. The taxidermy Sylvina had given me was illegal contraband. I should have destroyed the hummingbird anyway, could have tried to find a way to save myself, remained frozen instead. Not because of the mystery of the word salamander, but because of the blank spaces between hummingbird and salamander in Sylvina's message. Something watched me from those coordinates, and if something watched me, I was already involved. Code or symbol, distress signal or warning. Thank you. Thank you for that reading. Um, I really love that section and also the section later in the book where we sort of get a similar investi investigation. That's not the right word, but description of the of the salamander mm -hmm. um, and, and what it looks like, where it lives, etc. Um, so hopefully we'll get some questions streaming in from the audience, but just to sort of start us off, mm -hmm. um, I had some questions that I was curious about. Um, with this book. And I guess the first question that I have is so much of your work is, is interested and invested in environment and climate change, climate disaster. Um, people have often referred to your work as post-apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic. Um, and I wondered if you could just talk a little bit more about how this book in particular engages with, with that interest, um, especially as it sort of, we, we sort of get in the periphery that there's a pandemic going on in, in this novel. Um, and you know, we, we not so in the periphery, we have our own pandemics happening. Um, how does this book, how do you, I guess, think about the way that the world, our present world enters into your work and, and, mm -hmm. and exists there? Well, uh, just to address the pandemic thing first, I, I actually mm -hmm. finished up edits during the beginning of the pandemic. And I mm -hmm. already had the idea there would be something like that in the background. And I left mm -hmm. it in the background rather than putting it in the foreground not just because it didn't really impact the plot of the book, but also because I felt like it's too soon. Like every mm -hmm. single person reading the book would bring their own experience of the pandemic. So if mm -hmm. I left it distant, but it was in there, every reader would bring that into the book. And so sometimes I think about what is the, what are most readers going to bring into the book mm -hmm. that I don't need to actually spell out so explicitly and maybe if i do spell it out explicitly i actually get in the way of the reader's mm -hmm. experience of the real world you know so there's mm -hmm. that there's also the fact that i've been writing about the environment and also climate crisis really and and, and ecological devastation and, and what we need to do about it since the 80s um this is not a new topic in literature it's definitely predates me but uh, but what I have noticed is that as the crisis looms closer to us, as a writer, my re response is to get closer to it. Mm. And so I think that's why Hummingbird Salamander is really set at best 10 seconds into the future and is the book of mine that that's most like our or is our reality. Uh, and that's just mm. because everything feels so close now. It's impossible as a writer not to just feel it intimately in that way. And so I felt like I needed to grapple with it more directly. And then also, you know, I, you know, I actually, this started actually at Vanderbilt University. That's the mm -hmm. first university that invited me to speak in an environmental way after Annihilation came out. Wow. And uh, yeah, no. And, and so I had to do a whole presentation, kind of like form my thoughts that had been oh. kind of subconscious in the book for that. And that was like the template for a lot of what came later. But the point of that is that, you know, then as I started talking to even like science departments, which is, you know, mm -hmm. as a novelist is such a such an honor, um, students would be like, we like Annihilation a lot, but we want something more direct. And so, mm -hmm. you know, how do I as a as a writer who is very organic deal with that, who doesn't want to be didactic? And and so I just put it in the back of my my subconscious and I was like, maybe something will naturally come out that's more direct. And so. Hummingbird Salamander, because it's a mystery thriller about environmental topics, uh, I felt that would kind of energize information. So Jane has to find out things uh, that are clues, basically, that in another book would just be kind of like inert facts. 
Uh, and so I thought that was really interesting. And so, so mm -hmm. it was also kind of the result of a challenge from, from the interactions I would have at least interdisciplinary conferences and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So following up on that question, um, someone has raised this, this question mm -hmm. that feels very close to that. Um, do you think that there are things that seem apocalyptic now in terms of climate change um, that will become mundane in the future? Um, mm. Kind of a challenging question. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, th I, th I think the, the issue is that there are things happening now to people in certain areas, certain countries, certain parts of certain countries, like parts of the U.S., mm -hmm. um, where their experience is now very different of climate change than somebody who hasn't been affected by it in a very direct, visceral way. And so mm -hmm. one thing I think literature can do is distribute reality more evenly by showing what mm -hmm. the effects are to somebody who maybe hasn't been affected as much. And so when I think about like, you know, how someone might be impacted by a novel, and I can be very cynical about how much literature can kind of push things forward, even in like, it sounds dry, like, but like a policy direction, like we need better policy, we need better, you know, yeah. um, it, it's that maybe it can convince somebody who thinks this is happening 30 or 40 years from now, mm -hmm. that actually it's happening right now, because there are people out there to which it is happening right now. Um, and so that's part of my answer to the question. The other is just absolutely everything we're seeing now will be exponentially um, worse uh, for a long time because even with uh, carbon capture, even with green technology, there's still the carbon that's already been emitted and that will have an effect right. on the environment. Uh, and, and so um, the only thing that is left to know is whether feedback loops and things like that make things get out of control in a very fast way or if we still have a chance to adapt to it and plan for it and try to uh, save ourselves in the biosphere as best as possible. Um, mm. But but the answer there is that obviously we have to try everything we can, um, uh, you know, as much as we can uh, and, and not give up on it. Uh, mm. But it is a very complex issue that that um, that can go a lot of different ways. And I don't think uh, climate scientists are entirely sure of just how bad it can get how, how quickly. Hmm. Um, sort of a follow-up question to that. We have, someone has asked, non-human animals are showing signs of adapting biologically to a warmer planet. Do you think humans will adapt? Um, well, I mean, we're already seeing the, the issue of humidity uh, paired with, with uh, higher temperatures being kind of mm -hmm. fatal in some of these heat waves. And so the evidence I have is that we're probably not going to have enough time to adapt if we don't mm -hmm. manage to turn things around. Um, certainly there are certain adaptations that we're probably already unconsciously making at a societal level or, or mental adaptations in a way. <laughs> uh, but in terms of physical adaptations, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's tough to say. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's things you see in the, in, in the study of, 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 of animals like uh, the snail kites in Florida where the kind of snail that they uh, ate got wiped out and mm. their beaks adjusted over a decade to eat another kind of snail. That's a pretty right. intensely short period of time. So there right. definitely is like, like the, the questioner asked, says this, this ability for some to adapt, but, but um, where, you know, to, <laughs> to adapt to uh, the kinds of things that are coming, I think is, um, um, I mean, I, I'm, I don't think I'm going to, like grow gills and 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 be able to absorb 100 percent humidity <laughs> along with 120 degree heat anytime <laughs> soon let's put it that way <laughs> not funny, but it kind of you know mm -hmm. you got to laugh about some 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 things about it <laughs> um Someone has asked, can you give a brief synopsis of the book? So I realize um, I got too excited about the introduction and forgot to explain what the book was about. Uh, is that something that you would like to just a, a sort of yeah, brief well, yeah, what's sure. going well, on I mean, there? I kind of actually did at the beginning in terms of um, mm -hmm. literally Jane is given this, this key to a, a, a storage unit in which there's this taxidermy hummingbird and a note from Sylvina. It's just the words hummingbird dot 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 basically salamander mm -hmm. and uh, salamander is is very charged for her because of her past and 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 what salamanders mean to her mm -hmm. and she becomes hooked in part by that and part by what she finds out about hummingbirds and she basically gets uh, embroiled in a in a in a 
in kind of like a a, a, a whirlpool of of of, of mass machinations by uh, wildlife traffickers, uh, by what Sylvina herself as a, this dead eco terrorist or eco activist was up to. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a group called the Friends of Sylvina who are kind of like carrying out her 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 mission, so to speak, which you know is obscured. Is this a is this is this an eco terrorist? Is this something more hopeful than that? And mm -hmm. so Jane is drawn into that in such a way that she risked a lot. Um, and uh, I, I think that another person might not risk what she risks, but she's a very particular kind of uh, individual. Mm -hmm. And uh, and things just kind of, you know, she gets caught up in this in such a way that she can't get out of it uh, without yeah. giving too much away. Yeah, yeah. And that's something that um, just as 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 a reader, like the, the sort of experience of her throughout the novel, she has such a intense personality, such a, a specific personality. And you're right. I, I, half the time I was thinking, why are you making these choices? Is this worth it? You know, are you, are you going to be able to come back from this? Um, and I was worried about that <laughs> throughout the, until the end of the book. Um, so it was very, it was very, um, it, it really captured me in that way, um, just the way that the the story unfolds and the way that we understand what it is that Sylvina is up to, what it is that she wants Jane to know, but also what it is that Jane has sort of harbored um, as far as her past, her memories, what it is that she cares about. Um, yeah, and, and I hope that I, I give clues, but this doesn't give too much away, that, that I, I think Jane's trying, has is looking when this comes into her life for an excuse to blow up her life. Uh, that she has a life that a lot of people would envy, but that is not right for her. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think that becomes clearer in the second section where she becomes more fully the person that she's most comfortable uh, yeah. being. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so that made her an interesting character. The pivotal scene for me is there's a scene where she's being followed by someone up a hill. And I actually wrote this scene very early and I couldn't get it right. Every, every variation I did was wrong. And then I suddenly mm -hmm. realized that she and Jane is a very physically powerful person would would actually turn around and just hit this guy. And, and that was that was very telling because, you know, mm -hmm. even though she's physically strong, she doesn't know if the guy is a gun or not. So it's also very much mm -hmm. insightful to the kind of risk she's willing to take and who she is that she does that. Yeah. Uh, once I had that scene down, then I knew exactly who she was. Yeah. And I, I find her incredible because she just she'll just take risks and then later she's like should i have done that you know what never mind i'm just gonna keep going with i'm gonna keep steamrolling ahead <laughs> um someone has asked um my question concerns the space you create for non-human consciousness in a lot of your work um are there influences here in terms of reporting or science research so how do you incorporate those things um into your work that's a really good question. I had a prior novel, Dead Astronauts, where I wrote from the point of view of a fox. And that was interesting because I realized that if I was really writing from the point of view of a fox, it would just be a 500 page novel of smells because that's how foxes mm -hmm. communicate. And then we just have to try to translate or interpret what all these smells meant in terms of the mm -hmm. sense of a novel. And uh, you mentioned the, the monster story. That's about as far as I can go in terms of, you know, kind of getting out there to the point where where the non-human takes over to the point where big things almost become nonsensical so right. you know i always tend to filter the non-human through some kind of human intervention so the fox in mm -hmm. that case has been altered by human beings so that it's and it resents the fact that it's now kind of got a hybrid intelligence that's fox but okay. also human uh, and that allows me as a writer to have the construct in place to feel like i can actually write this thing mm -hmm. um, and then I do keep keep track of all the animal behavior science. One of the things that really irks me in a lot of uh, speculative fiction or fiction in general is writers clearly researching other things in their novel, but being lazy about the animal component. Mm. Um, and the reason, and, and just like relying on like old information that their parents told them when they were young or something, you know, about how animals <laughs> are or whatnot. And not to be, you know, not to sound too jerky about that, but I just feel like that's been a missed opportunity in some narratives when you don't mm -hmm. consider that element when you put it into a story. And so I'm always mm -hmm. very purposeful to think, you know, even if an animal is in the background, what is that animal doing? What does animal behavior science tell us that animal, if it's in a realistic context, um, 
is about in that context and, and, and make sure that that's accurate. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, someone else has asked, um, you're very active and smart on Twitter. Um, what do you like about that platform? What do I like about that hell site? Um, let's see. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I've been on Twitter too much since the lockdown and, and we're still because Tallahassee is kind of backwards. We're still in lockdown because mm. we can't get it right. So mm -hmm. it's since March of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been on Twitter almost every day during that time and not traveling. And um, in some ways, I think that is driving me around the bend on the on others. I have found a way to play on Twitter mm. um, in terms of posting wildlife uh, photos, uh, joking around about various things while also trying to push, you know, various social and environmental causes. And, and I think mm. in part because there's been such great fan reaction to like Annihilation and to Born, including mm. fan art and stuff. And that's been part of the interaction. People expect to have that sense of play when they come to my Twitter feed. And so that, that mm. part I really love. And I really appreciate that the fans and the readers interact that way with me because it's, it's really saved me these last couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, but I also pick my spots. You know, if somebody who has more experience or life experience in a particular topic has an opinion on Twitter, I am more likely to retweet that than give my stupid ass opinion on about the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of being smart about it, it's like being humble enough to know that you don't know everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I follow, I also use Twitter to follow a lot of different environmental uh, uh, causes around the world and get the perspectives of people who are not just in the U S for example, on various issues. Okay. So, um, so that's, that, that's one thing that I like uh, quite a bit about Twitter is I can get that perspective. Yeah. And you can get it sort of straight from the horse's mouth, so yes, to speak, um, exactly. rather than filtered through new mm -hmm. sites or things like that. Mm -hmm. That's something I also really appreciate about, about the platform. Um, mm -hmm. if you can avoid all the, uh, all the garbage. <laughs> Yeah. I know. <laughs> um, kind of related to that, someone has asked, do you have pets? Have they appeared in your work? I know they've appeared on your Twitter. <laughs> we used to have four cats. Um, we never meant to have four cats. Uh, <laughs> but um, but we actually got our last cat, Neo, in a yard sale down the street at our old house. And when it said cat, free cat at the yard sale on a sign, we were like, there's something wrong here. And we went inside. Um, this beautiful Maine Coon tuxedo cat, huge mm -hmm. cat, 18 pounds. They were debating whether to declaw him or just toss him out in the backyard and let him fend oh for gosh. himself. So we immediately took him. So that, that meant we were up to four cats. And now we're down to one, Neo, that same cat, mm -hmm. who I wanted to call Massive Attack because he <laughs> likes to land on my chest in the middle of the night from, from far <laughs> above and give me a heart attack. Uh, but but my wife, Anne, said that Neo was 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 enough because he is the one. But anyway, so he he definitely is the star of my uh, Twitter feed. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just this amazing, amazing uh animal who has actually been like the prototype for certain descriptive aspects of the giant bear in Bourne. So mm. like when Neo hangs over his cat tree, his shoulders are so massive that it's a great detail that you can kind of transfer mm. to the bear in Bourne. Mm -hmm. So, so that's what I do sometimes is I sometimes will take details, first hand details of animals that I see and, and transfer them into other contexts if, if, if it mm. seems appropriate. And so our cat has made cameos as other animals. <laughs> <laughs> I find that that's every time I meet a writer with some pets, somehow their pet ends up in the work, even if it's in this sort of undercover uh, way, I, my own work included. Like I have so oh, my cool. dog just oh, worms her way into she's a she's an Australian Kelpie. She's oh, a okay, she's a rescue. Cool. Yeah, um, really cool. So kind of similar um, yeah. in that she just she also has a lot of trauma. So like oh, that's something that yeah. like my work is very, very invested in. And mm. I, I feel like I can see in her so clearly, you know, mm. the things that mm -hmm. are happening and trying mm -hmm. to figure out what, what she's about, how is she right. trying to speak to me? Um, mm. You know, mm. how is she trying to communicate what mm. she has been afraid of, how her life is yeah. changing. And that's something that like, uh, I feel like my own work is deeply, deeply invested mm. in um, mm. sort of how do we, communicate across 
a language boundary that isn't mm -hmm. just, you know, speaking a different sort of human language, but mm -hmm. how do we think about behavior and, and sort of across species, how do we interact with the world? Um, uh, so th I, I think that's partly what draws me to your work as well, mm -hmm. is that there is a similar kind of investment, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, no. And, and, um, uh, I mean, born in particular is about all kinds of trauma and um, trying to overcome it. And I think sometimes the differences in my books are like Annihilation is about people who can't connect, mm -hmm. who are trying to grapple with this thing that does at times deal out trauma. And Born right. is about people who desperately are trying to connect in the face of all of this. And and, right. and uh, so that makes a very different kind of a, approach to those those two things. And then with regard to animals, you know, this, 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 this is a very practical thing too. You know, I encountered a box turtle in our yard uh, the other day and I just thought, cool, box turtle. And, you know, we have like five or six of them. And then mm -hmm. I only realized after I took the photo that there was a hole, a little hole in its shell. And I realized that what I should have done is I should have inspected it to see if there was like an animal bite, because usually what if there's a hole in the top of the shell, it means there's a right. bite underneath. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I agonized for like two days till I saw the animal again, was able to, sh to, 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 to see that it was actually a, an old wound that had healed. Oh. Um, but you know, you, animals can't tell you, <laughs> right. they can't tell you and, and so things that are, um, animals that don't, um, that we don't project onto as much like turtles and alligators and things like that. You, you, they, they, they're almost completely like closed off to us because we don't think of them as having emotions or having any kind of thought exactly. at all. Yeah. Um, and so that's something that I come back to a lot too, even just in the yard sometimes. Yeah, I think of that often as just, you know, I have these moments where I think I wish I could put my dog in therapy um, mm. so she could tell me what's wrong. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but they no. can't, <laughs> yeah. you know, so we have to figure out other ways of, of, of finding out what's going on. Mm. Um, another question that has come up uh, is, do you feel a responsibility to readers because you write a lot about mm. climate change? How do you maintain a sense of hope or or do you? Well, I mean, I think the, the, the only responsibility I think a writer has to the reader is to, to be true to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain things within a narrative where I will, again, you know, as a young writer, I didn't really think about like what the reader brings into the text, but I do think about mm -hmm. that a lot. So it's not that I don't think about the reader, but, but um, a responsibility. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like these things come so much out of the subconscious and they're so uh, permeating us now that it, it's hard to think of responsibility so much as just this is the thing that the reaction I I had to something on some subconscious mm -hmm. level that's come out as as narrative so it's kind of hard to think of what the responsibility is there except then you know to make sure that you're fairly accurate because there are a lot of books that are near future where quite mm -hmm. frankly there's a lot of details that are not scientifically accurate and then they get reviewed as if those are realistic books and that kind of drives me a little nuts. It's one thing if you're writing a surrealistic narrative mm -hmm. and, you know, obviously you're, you're taking kind of poetic license there and it doesn't have to be factual, but, um, but so that, that, that is, I think what, what I would say. And then as for a sense of hope, Hey, it's not about hope or despair. It's about the actual facts and what we do with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I feel like the question of hope and not in this context, but often in articles is, is the subtext is, is it too late? <laughs> and the fact is that it's never mm -hmm. too late because right. the, the more we do, the more we save somebody, the more we save something. Mm -hmm. um, so if we, if we just, if we, if we think in those absolutes, we begin to lose the plot of what it is we're actually needing to do. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, another question that has come up is you often write women whose lives are embroiled in these enormous ecological issues. Um, can you talk a little bit about your about writing female protagonists, especially when so much eco policy ends up uh, set by male led government? Mm. Well, I mean, I think the one case where I have government involved is um, in, in a very explicit way is authority and there the character is uh, a, a man as the mm -hmm. main character. So that kind of, in a way, and, and he's completely inept because he's using <laughs> systems that are not up to the task. Uh, mm -hmm. And he's bringing things into it that make it, you know, solving the mystery of area X not up to the task. The writing the women thing, uh, sometimes there's a, 
both a subconscious thing and then also like a secondary thing where it's like with annihilation you know once i wrote the thing onto the page and they were just their function not named at first i was like okay what is who are they and i slept mm -hmm. on it and while i was sleeping you know and while i was thinking about it before i slept on it i was like god do i hate expeditions in fiction or movies where there's one token woman she's not wearing <laughs> the same damn uniform as everybody else <laughs> And, you know, and, and things just go downhill from there uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the representation. And so when I woke up in the morning, it wasn't so much that it was a conscious decision. It's just my subconscious said, yeah, actually, they're all women. And this is what I what you know about them. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, I think it's really that the readers gave me permission or license to keep writing women characters mm -hmm. because of the reaction to the Southern Reach and that I'd at least done enough right that most people like those characters or found them to be in some sense authentic. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, I do think sometimes I don't know why I find um, male protagonists a little boring and I, I don't know why exactly. Um, <laughs> and so I, I do, mo I, I think maybe two thirds of the protagonists are right now are usually women. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have about eight, 10 minutes left. So this might be the last question. Um, but someone has asked, uh, or someone has said many thanks to you and Anne for editing the great big book of science fiction. Um, and then has asked, does editing or anthologizing influence your writing? Um, and how so? Yeah, um, we, we did all these huge doorstopper anthologies, starting with the weird, uh, which was commissioned mm -hmm. by a British editor at a company where they actually um, canceled the anthology at one point. And then the next day they got an order for 4,000, uh, a pre-order for 4,000 copies from a South yeah. African greeting card store company. So we actually got these weird, uh, these weird photographs from people in South Africa saying, hey, your, your anthology is right here in the Hallmark greeting card section. <laughs> I still don't know. Is it somebody who liked weird fiction who owned the company? But anyway, that, that saved that anthology and that led to all these other ones. And of course, the weird was very, very successful. The weird was something that I re we researched and read uh, for before I wrote Annihilation. And so mm -hmm. I think that reading six million words of fiction formed this kind of uh, layer in the back of my subconscious when I was writing Annihilation. Mm -hmm. And when you have to read that much, that you know, relatively quickly, I, I think it, it, you know, certain parts of it take uh, on a subconscious level a lot uh, sooner than they might otherwise. And the same thing with the big book of science fiction. It made me much more relaxed about a lot of things like um, just seeing how much um, classic stuff was actually crap was really quite fascinating. Um, seeing <laughs> how many contemporary or writers from like the 70s were just basically doing uh, pastiche of like a writer from the twenties, um, <laughs> seeing how poorly award-winning stories fared in terms of like actually still being relevant. Hmm. Um, it really just, as a writer, it's just really refreshing and you, you begin to not really take certain aspects, uh, that are beyond your control anyway, that seriously. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then you also learn so much about, um, different mm -hmm. approaches to craft because we always commission translations. We're always, you know, most of our anthologies have like uh, translations from at least 20 to 40 different countries. Hmm. Um, you then have conversations with the translators about the traditions in their countries and you learn stuff. So I would hmm. say it has been immeasurably enriching in terms of like experimenting with narrative and, and hmm. not being bound to the kind of classic or traditional story structures that you often often see in fiction. So. Hmm. Um. We only have about five minutes left, so I think I will um, ask, I guess, just one final question, and this is about writing in general. And I was wondering, um, you know, how has your relationship to your work changed um, since over the course of your career? You know, now having written, you know, a couple of trilogies, um, anthologized quite a bit um, and, and sort of done some criticism as well. Um, how is your relationship to writing and the way that you think about your own writing um, and maybe the way your writing has been classified into genres like new weird um, and things like that um, from like that first novel to mm -hmm. now? 
Yeah, I try. I try as hard as possible to avoid labels, just because. Um, mm -hmm. And how, how many words salamander, like you said, is light, lightly departure even from the other stuff. It, it's always drawing on different kinds of traditions, and so I feel like if I if one label is applied, then readers come into a book with the wrong expectations of what it's going to be. One mm -hmm. of my favorite reviews on, I think, one of the review sites of uh, Annihilation was, "He's doing it wrong." Um, which, which meant that it didn't fit the template, right? Mm -hmm. And that's because they'd probably come into it expecting one thing and it turned out to be another. Uh, so I try to avoid the labels as much as possible. I've been doing that from the very beginning. Um, I do, again, you know, uh, leave more space for the reader now than I did as a, mm -hmm. as a relatively arrogant 20 something writer who, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, kind of like was very much, uh, narrowly focused on, on the words and the art of it, um, which I still believe in, but I believe in mm -hmm. leaving the space for the, the imagination of the reader too, and a sense of play. But, um, I think the biggest change, one thing that's never, never going to change is every time I sit down to write a, a novel, there's this amazing, terrifying, brilliant feeling that I've never written a novel before and I don't know how to do it. And this is going to be the time I don't, I don't finish one. <laughs> I think that's actually really good. It's like, I think when I don't have that feeling anymore, it means I'm not pushing myself and I'm not having fun, if that makes any sense. Cause it, it keeps me engaged to, to feel like I'm doing, at least feel like I'm doing something I haven't done before. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, is, is understanding that for me personally, I've never um, written something too late. I've sometimes written it too soon, which is to say, hmm. I can think about something for years and it will stay fresh and then I can write it down. But sometimes I've been too eager to put something on the page before the characters have developed or the situations or whatever it is I need mm -hmm. for the story to be successful. And then, then it's kind of stillborn or it's not, it doesn't come out right, doesn't get finished. Um, and so I have a lot more uh, patience now. And I, what I do in the meantime is I write down notes on individual note cards that I carry around with me, which is actually, it's very old school, but it's very good for sequencing. It's very easy to just sequence these into the, the sequence mm -hmm. of the novel eventually before I actually start typing anything in. And that, that rewards my subconscious. Uh, but then by the time I sit down to write, I do fewer drafts now than I used to. I think because I have all of this accumulated material yeah um, and that might be more about process than anything else um other than that i just try to stay somewhat aware of what's happening uh and who's coming up in the world and read new writers um mm -hmm. to delay that inevitable moment where i become an old fart and completely <laughs> irrelevant um so uh that's the other mm -hmm. thing that I, I still try to do Oh, thank you so much. Um, we only have about two minutes left. Um, so I just want to leave. Are there any final words that you'd like to leave us with before we wrap up? No, I just really enjoyed this. And thanks so much to the festival for yeah. having me. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, once again, thanks to everybody who has uh, participated in this, asked questions, um, or just just observed, um, just been a sort of audience member. Um, and once again, thanks to the festival, thanks to Humanities Tennessee, um, Parnassus, Vanderbilt, um, everyone, all of the people. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank for you. Have, thank you for being here. Thank you for your work. <laughs> Thanks. All right. I think.